Sergeants, if we can begin the recordings, uh, PC recording is underway. Recording to the cloud, all set. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Biondo, take us away. Good please. afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing for the Committee on Contracts. At this time, would all panelists please turn on the video for verification purposes. To minimize disruptions, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you'd like to submit testimony, please send via email to testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation, Chair Kalos. We are ready to begin. Chair, you're on mute. Good afternoon and welcome to this virtual hearing of the New York City Council's Committee on Contracts. My name is Ben Kalos and I'm chair of this committee. For those of you who are watching remotely, please feel free to participate in the hearing by tweeting me at Ben Kalos. Before we dive into today's hearing, I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Joni as well as Council Member Ayala. Today we will be hearing three bills all geared towards improving working conditions for our city's hardworking nonprofit human service provider workers. The first bill, uh, Introduction 1995, sponsored by Councilmember Ayala, seeks to improve the training requirements for security guards employed to work at our homeless shelters. Specifically, this bill would require all contracted shelter operators to ensure that all security guards working at the Department of Homeless Services shelters receive 40 hours of training after they are hired, including 10 hours of shelter specific training, as well as an eight hour annual refresher course. The second bill we are gathering feedback on today comes from Council Member Moya and also relates to security guards working at homeless shelters. If enacted, introduction 2006 would require entities operating shelters pursuant to contracts with the city to pay these security guard workers a prevailing wage. Finally, legislation we've been working on for quite some time, uh, introduction 2137 would extend the prevailing wage measure to all human service workers providing uh, her services pursuant to a city contract. Each year, the city contracts with human service providers to deliver a range of social services, including services for seniors, fosters, uh, care, after school care, mental health counseling, shelter and housing programs, food assistance to about 3 million New Yorkers. And yet these workers face their own financial hardship, as you may have read about. Uh, wages within nonprofit service providers who contract with the city are um, devastatingly low. And sadly, sometimes these service providers workers are so underpaid that they themselves are forced into relying on the same public assistance programs they help to provide. My office, for example, works closely with the New York Times and uh, Catherine Trapani uh, and Josh Dean at uh, uh, Human NYC to uncover numerous stories of homeless shelter workers who are themselves facing housing and security and living in homeless shelter, and it's not good enough. Uh, for far too long, these workers have carried out the work of delivering essential services, which during COVID-19 were more important than ever, without being fairly compensated. And it's time to move beyond the heartfelt thanks and appreciation, even applause for the workers to a prevailing wage. And uh, what we're talking about here is it isn't the nonprofit's fault. The city actually sets the wages in the contracts. They're actually, the city is actually forcing these wages down to try to cut costs wherever they can. And so often it's on the backs of our nonprofit workers. Uh, and so the city can and must do better. A prevailing wage simply must become the standard. And if we have to enact laws to enforce that, then we will, which is why we're introducing, sorry, why we're hearing these bills today. Now, I wanted to also note that um, we're, still going through a diet pandemic, we're seeing incredible financial difficulties. The city received a lot of support from the federal and state government. Our human services providers uh, actually faced a cut during the pandemic. And um, one of the issues being that we actually just last week announced uh, restoring that cut uh, to indirect services. Uh, and we have to make sure that we keep our nonprofit providers uh, going. 
And another big piece of this is whatever it is we pass in the council cannot be unfunded mandates. We need to baseline this funding in the council and in the budget to make sure that we can pay for it. We can't just tell the nonprofit providers to do more with less, which is a frequent refrain. Uh, I'd like to thank all the providers who are joining us today. And before we begin the testimony, I'd like to take a moment to thank the uh, Contracts Committee staff, our, uh, our, our outgoing Legislative Council, Josh Kingsley, who is filling in while our, uh, our, our returning Legislative Council, Alex Polinoff, was on uh, paternity leave. And I am so grateful that our city, uh, that our staff at the council is taking leave uh, here at the council. I believe we offer 12 weeks leave plus an additional four weeks, uh, which coupled together becomes 16 weeks. And I'm seeing the council now that that is in fact our uh, case. Uh, I also want to thank our policy analyst, uh, Leah Skripiak, uh, who's really been stepping up. Our financial analyst, Frank Sarno, and finance unit head, John Russell, for all their hard work. I, I want to just speak about prevailing wage because people may not know what it is. I'm a labor lawyer. Uh, there's different wages. There's the minimum wage. Uh, federally, that's around $7. Here in New York City, it's $15, not so around the state of New York. There's a living wage, which is something that can be bargained for, which is theoretically higher than the minimum wage. Here in New York City, the living wage is lower than the minimum wage. And then there's a prevailing wage. Uh, prevailing wage is determined by state law, and it has the controller go to a field, find all the people who perform a specific task within what would be a bargaining unit or would be a title, and finds out what the salary is within that sector. Uh, then they say this is what the prevailing wage is, and that would be what goes into the contracts. In the alternative, if 50% of the people in the title were represented by a labor union, then whatever was collectively bargained between the labor union, uh, the nonprofit providers, and the city in a three-party negotiation would become the provi uh, prevailing wage. Uh, this is actually a model for how we were able to wage, raise wages uh, for specific human service workers within daycare when we were able to raise wages for uh, pre-K. And so that's actually how we were able to do it. Um, I'd like to now turn it over to council member Ayala followed by council member Moya. Uh, we've, uh, and I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you, Chair Kalos. I'm council member Diana Ayala and I'm really happy to be here today um, where we will, we will hear bill, my, uh, my bill, intro 1995. Um, as was stated earlier um, by Council Member Kalos, uh, this bill would require that all Department of Homeless Service Shelter Security Guards receive upwards of 40 hours of training after they are hired, including 10 hours of shelter specific training, as well as an eight hour refresher training annually thereafter. While strong training standards are required for security officers working at city run shelters, Security staff at privately operated shelters are not afforded the same level of training. In fact, three out of four of these security officers are not required to be trained at all. It is imperative that all staff responsible for protecting residents residing in our shelters be given the tools that they need to create a safe and welcoming environment. Security officers protect some of the most vulnerable New Yorkers. Their work is demanding and at times dangerous. This required training would provide the best possible services to shelter clients so that the individuals and families who use the system feel safe accessing these service, the services they need to get back on their feet. We have heard from many dedicated security officers that they have, that have, that they have deep compassion for the residents that they serve and want access to the tools that will help them do their jobs most efficiently. Officers in privately run uh, shelters face stress, not just from conditions in a challenging work site, but from the risk to their health during the coronavirus pandemic and also from employment conditions, which place many of them in a position of economic instability. In this moment of time, when our city and our country is reckoning with how to enact racial, uh, racial justice, we must take the opportunity to look at every aspect of how we serve and support black and brown communities. The majority of the city's residents, the majority of people using the shelter system and the majority of the security workforce that serves them are black and brown. In addition to making shelters safer, this legislation will offer frontline workers an opportunity to grow their skills and to create a pathway to advancement and upward mobility. 
making these essential jobs better is a matter of um, racial and economic justice for the sake of these workers, for their families, and for the people that they serve. I look forward to hearing from you all today and to finally getting this bill passed. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Ayala, and uh, you couldn't have said it better. Within the human services, 80% of our workers are women, and 80% of those women are women of color. And as we saw at the beginning of the pandemic, so much money was directed at big corporations. And by creating a prevailing wage, by having these training requirements, we'll actually be putting the money where it needs to go uh, for a worker-led recovery. Not only that, these dollars will be going right into pockets of people who will be spending it in our local economy. I'd like to now turn it over to Francisco Moya, who perhaps has the most realistic uh, background. And so I'm hoping that is him, but it could just be the background faking me out. It is, it is me. It is me, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair Kalos, uh, and thank you, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm here to talk about Intro uh, 2006. As we know, throughout this pandemic, we've seen over and over, uh, again, the health and economic disparities, the rising cost of living, and the impact on the communities that were hardest hit by COVID. Uh, New York City's homeless shelter workers know what it's like to be on the front lines of a crisis, and that's why they signed up. They signed up to care for New Yorkers who find themselves in a personal state of emergency. Uh, they are the very people who continue to make sacrifices for countless New Yorkers, especially throughout this pandemic. Uh, for us to work towards the real recovery from COVID means that we cannot leave behind those that have suffered the brunt of this pandemic. Uh, how can we help New Yorkers get back on their feet if they're barely making ends meet? Uh, we cannot accept private contractors taking public dollars and then paying workers poverty wages without meaningful benefits. Prevailing wages can mean a worker doesn't uh, have to work multiple jobs to make ends meet. Prevailing wages can mean that a worker has a better shot of moving towards a permanent home. Prevailing wages can mean a step forward to closing the racial pay gaps. And while this doesn't solve the issues uh, to address the inequalities, it's a step in the right direction. Uh, it's how we will recover from this pandemic equitably uh, and with dignity. Uh, Amber Drummond, a homeless shelter security guard, expressed it. Uh, she is just here uh, fighting for an equitable standard of life uh, that all Americans uh, should have. Now, we need to be part of this fight, uh, and this is one step closer to doing that. We need to step up for the respect and the dignity of all workers. I stand with Amber and I stand with all my brothers and sisters who are predominantly black and brown, serving mostly black and brown New Yorkers. And I wanna take this opportunity to applaud uh, the members of 32BJ for their tireless dedication and for their fighting alongside me and the working class New Yorkers to build a fairer and more equitable city. And I wanna thank also my colleagues uh, who have signed on and for those uh, who will be joining me uh, in hoping to pass uh, this bill. So thank you very much, Chair, and thank you um, for the opportunity to speak on my bill. Thank you both very much. Uh, we're going to first hear from Michelle Jackson at Human Services Council, followed by Catherine Trapani at Homeless Services United and Norm Moran at United Neighborhood Houses. Uh, after that, we're going to hold our questions for those three, and at the conclusion of the third person's testimony, we'll open it up to questions. We'll then hear from David Cohen from 32BJ take questions. We'll then hear from SHNNY, Safe Horizons, Urban Pathways, JASA, and the Coalition for Behavioral Health, take questions. Uh, for those uh, three groups, uh, we'll have a five-minute clock on speakers. And uh, then after that, we have about 20 people signed up to speak, and there will be a two-minute clock, uh, and we will reserve questions until uh, those folks have all had a chance to speak. Uh, so there will be five opportunities for folks to ask questions, and uh, bill sponsors will have a 10-minute clock on their questions, and all other council members will have a five-minute clock, and I'll turn it over to committee council. Thank you, Chair Kalos. Uh, my name is Alex Polinoff, counsel to the Contracts Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I would like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called upon to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify individually, so please listen for your name to be called. During the hearing, if a council member would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in order. As the chair mentioned, we will be limiting council member questions to 10 minutes for the bill sponsors, which includes the time it takes for the panelists to answer the questions, 
and five minutes for the other committee members. Please note that for the ease of this virtual hearing, there will not be a second round of questioning outside of questions from the committee chair. Uh, all hearing participants should submit their testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, since the administration is not present, we will now turn directly to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike during our typical council hearings, we'll be calling on these individuals one by one to testify. Uh, each panelist, as the chair mentioned, will be given two minutes to speak. And please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function. And again, we will call on you after the panelists have completed their testimony. Uh, for the panelists themselves, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will set the timer and give you the go ahead to begin. Uh, please wait for the sergeant to make this announcement before delivering your testimony. Uh, we will uh, now turn to- uh, Just quick clarification, five yeah. minutes for the first panelists from nonprofits and large organizations, and then we'll go to back to two minutes for individuals. Great, thank you, Chair. Um, as the Chair mentioned, we will turn, we will begin testimony with Michelle Jackson, followed by Catherine Trapani, and then Nora Moran. Uh, Ms. Jackson, you may begin as soon as the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Great, thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chairperson Kalos, members of the New York City Council Committee on Contracts and other council members who have joined today. My name is Michelle Jackson. I'm the Executive Director of the Human Services Council, a membership organization representing over 170 human service organizations uh, in New York City. Uh, and they range in services from child, child care to senior services, mental health services, homeless services, and everything in between. I first really want to thank you, Chair Kalos, uh, and the, the council members here today for your work in um, helping pass the restoration of indirect funding and baselining for next year. That's a huge win for the sector. Um, council member Kalos, you have been a real champion for this and we really appreciate um, your work and all the council members uh, who really kept this issue alive. It's um, definitely in the weeds, <laughs> and, uh, but real important money. And you'll hear from members today who will testify um, also about you know how much that money means to them. Um, so a huge win for us. Um, Unfortunately, the cuts to indirect are not the only crisis that demands immediate solution uh, in the human services sector. The need to invest in the human services workforce is uh, immense and something that the Human Services Council and other coalitions you'll hear from today have talked about uh, over the years. City contracts currently pay essential human services workers poverty wages, which is simply an outrage. Uh, tax dollars in particular should not be used to fund poverty level wages. And there must be a dedicated effort at the city level to lift all of these salaries. Uh, and this is also, by the way, not just a city issue, it is also a state issue that uh, we are also advocating for at the state level. HSC is in support of any effort to lift wages of not just human services workers, but any labor force that is not paid an equitable wage. The human services sector exists to eliminate poverty. And one way to do that is to pay equitable wages across sectors. The human services workforce is primarily women and people of color who do life-saving work as we've seen in COVID in our communities and have seen low and stagnant wages for decades. Establishing a prevailing wage can be an important vehicle to move to higher and more appropriate wages if the prevailing wage schedule is established, not using current salary levels, but comparable salary levels in government and the private sector. Uh, the average human services worker is paid between 20 and 40 percent less than they would if they were employed by government or in hospitals or the private sector. So while we support the prevailing wage for all human services workers, uh, we are very, you know, the, the wage schedule will be very important because if the wage schedule only looks at current salaries, it will just kind of create a system of poverty wages for the human services workforce. Um, if the city is ready to make that necessary adjustment and then also fund this on human services contracts, uh, this will be a huge positive step uh, in the right direction for human services workers. There isn't a wage schedule for human services workers. Government sets those salaries on contracts or doesn't set them, but certainly doesn't provide enough money in the contract to pay equitable wages. And in fact, we've had some providers who have won RFPs with the city and been told that they pay their workers too much. Uh, on certain contracts, uh, and those have to be adjusted and usually downward. Uh, so we are in full support of a prevailing wage for human services workers that does holistically. So while we do not support the bill only for shelter workers or shelter security guards, 
because we need to have a holistic view of the human services uh, sector and we need to raise wages across all salary lines and staff lines. Um, if you do one at a time, you create further disparity in organizations. And if it's also unfunded, it creates an unfunded mandate on organizations who are also who are already struggling before COVID, certainly during COVID more so, um, to make ends meet. Um, if the city is ready with this prevailing wage bill to create a wage schedule that lifts the wages of all human services workers and make the necessary investment to fund this on government contracts. Uh, and by the way, when you fund it on government contracts, nonprofits still have to come to the table with their own private fundraising to make up for staff lines that are not part of city contracts. But many are willing to, to, to make that decision in order to lift up the wages of their workers. It's something that they absolutely want to work in partnership with the city with. So if the city is ready to make that necessary investment, it will perhaps be the largest investment nationally in the sector and would help ensure fair and equitable wages for essential workers that will uplift our communities most impacted by COVID-19 and better prepare our city for the next disaster. Human services workers were out there from day one, keeping people safe at home and alive. Uh, and they have not been rewarded for their work uh, in a meaningful way. Uh, we've seen the disparities of it being a women-centered, people of color-centered workforce exacerbated during COVID, and they couldn't stay home while others could. Uh, and so uh, in closing, I just wanna again, thank you, uh, Chair Kalos, for creating this legislation and for an important step forward uh, in talking about the importance of the human services workforce and the need right, to lift the right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Trapani, or Ms. Jackson, excuse me. Uh, unless there are any questions for the members, we'll move to the next panelist. We're gonna hold questions till all three are done. Got it, okay. In that case, uh, we'll next hear from Catherine Trapani, followed by Nora Moran, and then David Cohen. Ms. Trapani, um, you may begin when the start One moment, I just, want to been, I just want to acknowledge you've been joined by council member Helen Rosenthal. Uh, who uh, was integral in getting the indirect to begin with and has been a key partner since. You, you may now begin, sorry. Time starts now. Thank you so much. And um, I, I will never mind pausing to, to say thank you to, to Council Member Rosenthal for, for helping with indirect. Um, and I owe a, a, a lot of thanks to you, Chair Kalo. So thank you very much. Um, my name is Catherine Trapani. I am the Executive Director at Homeless Services United. And we are a coalition of about 50 nonprofit agencies serving homeless and at risk adults and families in New York City. Every day, our member programs work with thousands of homeless families and individuals, preventing shelter entry whenever possible and working to end homelessness through counseling, social services, healthcare, legal services, and pu public benefits assistance, among many other supports. Um, we're really grateful to you, Chair Carlos, and members of this committee and the council for your commitment to supporting our workforce um, and for everyone that uh, everything that you do um, and your leadership on, on just homeless issues in general. Um, I, I think that we're going to disagree a little bit on the on the mechanisms, but um, on the merits, we are with you. Our our workers work incredibly hard and have been heroes and deserve to be fairly compensated. Um, as Michelle pointed out in her remarks, uh, a prevailing wage schedule doesn't actually exist for human services workers. So we're concerned that this mechanism to get to the wage parity and equity that we all seek may not be a viable pathway to get to our shared goals. Um, Homeless Services United supports increasing wages for all human services workers and frontline staff in our programs. For decades, the city has paid our nonprofit workers a fraction of what they pay their own city employees for the same work, and that absolutely must change. The intention of the council to increase wages for nonprofit workers is commendable. And, and like I said, we are just so proud of our staff. We agree that it is time to increase their pay and wholeheartedly support the mechanism to do so proposed by the city council in your budget response. Um, that we should give everybody a COLA of at least 3% now and set aside a fund to reserve, uh, reserve for wage increases that can be applied on a contract by contract basis so that the wages are actually funded in advance of a mandate taking place. Um, sorry, I'm trying to summarize. I have more detailed remarks um, in written testimony they'll be emailing uh, to the council. Um, but I, I think like the point is, is that, you know, city agencies like DHS had a model budget process. And in that process, they were supposed to update the rates that shelter providers were paid um, in order to provide high quality service. 
Throughout the time that we were working on the model budget, our members repeatedly asked the Department of Homeless Services to look at wages, and we were repeatedly told no. Um, it has been an uphill battle uh, to get them to adjust salaries at all, um, and to do so, you've had to prove that a job was vacant for a certain amount of time, or the turnover is abnormally high, and it was just a really inadequate exercise. So I think that the council's proposal to create a fund to set aside some money, restrict it to personal cost increases and apply it on a contract by contract basis is the way that we're going to get to a more equitable wage scale. Um, because if you were to pass a bill that has a mandate for a schedule that doesn't exist, um, I just worry that we'll never get it done. Um, and so I think like we've learned a lot of lessons. I think the indirect is a good one where the city can make this promise um, and say, oh, we're going to do this thing. And then on a whim, they'll just change their minds. And you're sort of stuck with a mandate and a process for calculating a rate and then no way to actually pay for it. And so I think when I looked at these bills, um, I just had that fear that that would happen again. Um, so I think that um, if we if we want to pay people, the best way to do it is to put the funding in the contracts at the contract level and baseline it and 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 be done. So um, that's really the gist of our position. Um, our workers deserve the money. Um, we we want to see it, um, but we have some details in our testimony about some technical challenges that we have with the bills as presented that we would urge the council to address if you choose to go down this path to make sure that the commitment that you're making is really real and viable and something that can actually sustain our workforce in the long term. Um, so with that, I will end my testimony and thank you for your commitment to our workforce and certainly, you know, answer questions at the when the time comes at the end of the panel. Thank you, Ms. Trapani. Uh, we will now hear from Nora Moran, the last member of this panel, at which point we will um, turn to the council members for questions. Uh, Ms. Nora Moran, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Nora Moran. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at United Neighborhood Houses. Um, also wanna echo the thanks uh, that both Michelle and Catherine said about indirect. Um, it's really, uh, really wonderful that that funding has been restored and that you know community-based organizations are able to be you know, on a more sustainable and financial path uh, going forward. Um, so I'm here to testify today specifically about intro 2137 um, and want to share some comments and perspectives from the settlement house perspective and from UNH's perspective. Um, as folks may know, settlement houses employ nearly 25,000 New Yorkers. Um, these people often live in the communities and neighborhoods that they serve. Many of them have gone through and come up the organizations themselves and now have decided to commit their career to working there. Um, UNH recently conducted a study of, of settlement house employees with uh, Fordham University Graduate School of Social Service, where we found that a lot of these workers uh, see this work as their life's mission. Um, they're very dedicated to the settlement house model, to the communities that they serve. Uh, but due to chronic underfunding, uh, many of these employees are subsisting on wages far below the cost of living in New York City. Um, settlement house uh, staff in our study reported that they were, quote, everything from skating by financially uh, to severely underpaid. Um, they have many financial debts uh, around student debts and loans, um, you know, and definitely struggle with receiving wages that are below a living wage. Um, and so, you know, regarding 2137, um, we absolutely support any effort to raise wages of human services staff. Um, we stand in solidarity with the Settlement House workforce who have identified that, you know, low wages are a problem as well as their leadership. Um, and we want to testify today with comments and suggestions to strengthen 2137 should it move forward. Um, so the first recommendation that we would offer is that, you know, this legislation um, should have a section that uh, covers the exact job titles that would be covered by the bill. Um, right now, it doesn't list specific titles. Um, there's a very broad range of titles in the human services world. We want to make sure that this legislation targets uh, those uh, positions that most need a prevailing wage and most need to be supported with a prevailing wage. Um, so it would be, you know, great to have a little bit more detail in the bill that constitutes that out so that we're really targeting support to, you know, lower wage frontline workers who really need this additional support. 
Um, the second would be adding language that would really target the requirements of the bill to employees whose salaries are paid for by city contracts. Um, a lot of uh, you know, human service organizations, as you know, provide uh, services through city contracts, as well as state contracts, funding from the federal government, um, and philanthropic funds. So right now, 2137 does not specify um, you know, that the prevailing wage requirements would apply just to employees whose salaries are paid through city contract funds. Um, we think that you know targeting that would help potentially ease some of the burdens um, that you know human service organizations might face, um, and also would make sure that we were not um, you know letting New York State and the federal government off the hook for uh, increasing funding for prevailing wages as well. Um, we would hope that you know if if something like this did pass, that there would be companion legislation and a similar investment made at the state level um, in order to make sure that you know the state was also supporting organizations in the right way. Um, and the final is, you know, obviously that this, uh, you know, any prevailing wages and any higher wages that are set absolutely need to be paid for. We've seen over and over again um, that, you know, unfortunately, uh, when times get tough, city government cuts funding to the human services sector. We just experienced this with indirect, and we certainly would not want a scenario where uh, there was a mandate to pay a prevailing wage and no funding in the contract in order to do that. Um, so we would, you know, like to see uh, provisions in the bill that would nullify the mandate uh, on the chance that city budgets and city contracts don't include line item funding to set that prevailing wage. Um, you know, we would not want a scenario where, um, you know, the, the prevailing wage was not able to be implemented because uh, there was no money in the contract. And at the end of the day, you know, that only hurts the workforce who then would not be able to have these higher wages. Um, and the final point that we'll just raise um, is actually one, you know, relating to the current budget. Um, it's great that the indirect cost rate initiative was restored. Um, it's also important to now now, you know, look at the nonprofit workforce um, and uh, look again at the need to uh, increase uh, cost of living adjustment and include that in the FY22 budget. Um, and we're asking that uh, the FY22 budget include a 3% COLA on the personnel services line of all human services contracts. Uh, and I see my time is up. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moran. We'll now turn back to Chair Kalos for questions for the panel. I want to thank the panel for working with us on this legislation to begin with, uh, working to try to get it as close as possible. I understand the mandate that this can't be unfunded. I understand the mandate that it can't be just a requirement on providers to pay a prevailing wage in the absence of actually a payment. And I completely support the uh, COLA. Uh, so I want to thank you. And, and I think the, the lack of questions for me is just because of the fact that we've been working so well. and. With five minutes to testify, we've gotten very good testimony that we can work with as well as what you've submitted. Uh, do any other members have questions who wish to raise their hand? I'd like to acknowledge you've been joined by Council Member Barron. Um, seeing no additional questions, Chair, if it's okay with you, we'll move to the next panel. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, next, we will hear from David Cohen, uh, followed by Michael Pullenberg and Nicole McVinua. Uh, Mr. Cohen, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is David Cohen. I'm the deputy political director at 32BJ and just, just getting my Zoom logistics in order here. Uh, I'm reading a uh, testimony today on behalf of 32BJ President Kyle Bragg. 32BJ um, is the largest building service union in the country with 85,000 of our members living in the New York City metro area. Uh, we strongly, 32BJ strongly supports uh, intros 1995 and intros 2006. Uh, these two bills provide needed and overdue reforms to the working conditions of security guards um, that ensure the safety of the city's contracted shelter system. Uh, it's something that 32BJ has been working on for a long time around contracted security work throughout New York City. Um, intro 1995 addresses the need for additional training for shelter security guards, and we thank uh, Council Member. <clears throat> Ayala for carrying that bill. And sorry if I didn't uh, say good afternoon to Chair Kalos and members of the committee. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm trying not to read specifically. Um, under the current practice, shelter guards need not receive more than the min minimum training required under law. Uh, while the legal minimum might be sufficient for a typical business, a shelter, as we know, is not a typical business. Um, according to a report by the Coalition of Homeless, the primary reason for homeless persons not returning to the shelter system was safety. 
So the city's commendable outreach efforts to unhoused persons will yield only small returns so long as the city shelters, excuse me, <clears throat> um, sorry, <clears throat> will yield only small returns so long as the city shelters are perceived to be unsafe. You know, with 40 hours of additional training, and that's the industry standard, the city shelters guards will be able to provide a more secure environment for shelter residents and themselves. Um, crucially, in addition to providing more advanced training that's not context specific, intro 1995 also requires training specifically related to the shelter environments. And that's what you know, we're gonna hear from workers later on about the need for the, these shelters, need for this training in the shelters. Um, I know I have a time. So intro 2006 would require shelter security guards be paid the prevailing wage. Um, security guards at city run shelters already paid the prevailing wage and some security guards saw their wages fall after certain shelters were privatized. Um, as recently as was highlighted in the New York Times article, the competition among contractors for city contracts, while perhaps to achieve lower costs, can also create a race to the bottom as to worker pay. And I think we heard from previous panels about the importance of, of paying our workers fairly. So as a result, those working at security uh, and in shelters may also be living at a shelter or facing housing insecurity. So our shelter system is supposed to help solve the homelessness crisis, not create additional homelessness. Paying these workers a prevailing wage is not oppositional to the goals of our shelter system, but furtherance of its goals. So lastly, these bills should ensure that those workers that ensure the safety of the shelter residents but in compliance with the city's fire code are also covered. These workers are also in need of family sustaining wages. Um, moreover, moreover, many of these workers provide security services and would benefit from the additional training. So we urge uh, members of the committee and the council um, to pass intros 1995 and intro 2006. Um, 32BJ strongly supports them. You're gonna hear from many workers today um, on why they need the standard, why we need the training. And I greatly appreciate the committee's time. And thank you again to the chairperson for holding this um, committee. And if I didn't thank lead sponsor in intro 2006, Francisco Moya, also thank you. Thank, thank you, you Mr. Kirk. Much, we've been working with uh, 32BJ on this issue dating back to before we had a hearing on Acacia. Uh, so thank you. I don't have questions because of just how much work we've been doing on this. Uh, do we have any questions from council members? Please feel free to raise your hand if you do. Uh, seeing none, we will thank uh, David Cohen from 32BJ. Thank you, thank you Chair. Uh, we're now going to continue with the next panel. Uh, next up is Michael Polenberg, followed by Nicole McVinua, and then Tierra Labrada. Mr. Polenberg, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Kalos and members of the committee. Uh, Michael Pollenberg, I'm Vice President of Government Affairs for Safe Horizon, the nation's largest nonprofit victim services organization. And I'm here to testify about intro 2137. Um, we're grateful to the chair uh, for recognizing the need to address the historically inadequate wages that so many staff in our sector receive. The longstanding belief reinforced time and again through contracts that fail to cover the full cost of service delivery, that the efforts of those who feed, shelter, and ensure the safety of vulnerable New Yorkers can be purchased at a discount must be refuted outright. The fact that the lowest wages in our sector are so often reserved for our staff of color is a stark example of the systemic racism that is built into our contracts. These jobs are also underpaid because they're seen as women's work, a reality which compounds the role of structural racism. At Safe Horizon, our staff have continued to provide in-person direct services throughout the COVID-19 pandemic to victims of violence and abuse in our domestic violence shelters, our five child advocacy centers, uh, and our street work project for homeless youth. Where in-person services couldn't be uh, offered safely, we quickly pivoted to offer critical services remotely, including at our 24 hour hotline, legal services and many other programs. There's no question our staff deserve a salary commensurate with the difficult and complex work inherent with responding each week to children and adults who have experienced harm. Um, we greatly appreciate the intent of 2137 and we have a few questions and concerns about how it will be operationalized, some of which have already been mentioned so far. 
the, you know, we're worried when we don't see funding attached to legislation that the administration may say, fine, we'll do this, but we're going to take away on the indirect cost increase that we fought so hard to get and that Councilmember Rosenthal and others fought so hard to, uh, to win. Uh, we would hate to see the city decide to hit one of these um, uh, funding sources against the other. Um, we're not sure, and this has been referenced today, what measures the controller will take to set prevailing wage schedules for our sector when no such thing exists currently, and that the already low rates will be codified, uh, further compounding the problem for, for, for the foreseeable future. Um, and the bill considers anyone who works for a human services con uh, in, in a provider, whether or not they're uh, paid through by a city contract to be covered by this bill. That means staff covered by state contracts, federal contracts, or other means. We're not sure how operationally one would pass on a rate increase to somebody paid for by a state contract. So we urge the council to consider these and other questions from stakeholders in our sector. And we look forward to continued discussions. I don't think in all of, you know, we have open staff meetings at Safe Verizon quite regularly. And I don't think there's an issue that rises to the forefront as much as the need to address salary inequities. So we're grateful to you, Chair Kalos, and to the full council for really trying to tackle this complex issue. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pollenberg. Um, seeing no questions, I will move on to the next panelist. Um, Nicole McVinua is up next, followed by Tiara Labrada and then Nadia Chait. Uh, Ms. McVinua, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Kalos and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Nicole McVinua and I'm the Director of Policy at Urban Pathways. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today. Um, Urban Pathways is a nonprofit homeless services and supportive housing provider. We is, serve single adults through street outreach, drop-in services, safe havens, extended stay residences, and permanent supportive housing. Uh, last year, we served over 3,900 New Yorkers in need. Um, wage equity in the human services sector is a critical issue. Um, I would echo Mr. Pollenberg and that this is the number one issue that is raised by our staff. Um, you know, employees working for nonprofit organizations contracted by the city have their wages set at much lower rates and receive fewer benefits than city employees, despite providing essential services on behalf of the city. Wage equity is also an issue of race and gender equity. 80% of human services workers are people of color and 82% are women. Prior to the pandemic, 60% of the workforce qualified for some form of public assistance. And a recent New York Times article, as was mentioned earlier, chronicled individuals who work in our city's homeless shelters while also living in them themselves. And we simply cannot allow this to go on any longer. It's wrong to design an industry that puts its own workforce in a position to require the very services that they provide. Uh, the poverty wages that are provided in our contracts also make hiring and man maintaining employees extremely difficult, and the high turnover rate of our staff is reaching a level of crisis. Uh, and this also negatively impacts you know, the uh, people that we serve uh, because they build relationships with, with these folks that are really critical to their success. So that's why we're testifying in support of Intro 2137 today. Uh, the creation of human, service, uh, human services prevailing wage has the potential to increase wages to a more appropriate level for the essential work of the sector. Uh, but for this potential to be realized, uh, there are several factors that need to be considered. Um, some have already been mentioned. The prevailing wage must be based on comparable salar salary levels in the government and private sector and not just on the current low wages of the human services sector um, that we see now because we don't wanna codify those low wages. Um, and the sector should be included in creating the methodology for setting the prevailing wage schedules. And uh, you know, it also must be backed by full funding from contracting city agencies on both our current human services contracts and future human services contracts going forward. Um, and for current contracts, if this legislation were to pass, it would be important for amendments to be put in place prior um, to the law going into effect as to not place financial burden uh, on organizations. Um, but we commend the comprehensive approach of intro 2137 that's aimed at lifting the entire sector at once um, and providing the necessary funding to do so. 
Um, and with that, we do not support intro 2006. Um, creating a prevailing wage for shelter security guards alone would only deepen the wage disparity between underpaid employees. Um, currently our shelter, you know, our security staff and our uh, cooks and our maintenance staff are all paid at similar wages and uh, creating a prevailing wage for just security staff, we think would really uh, just deepen the disparity. Um, and uh, intro 2006 also fails to provide a funding mechanism. Um, so, you know, we would like to see 2137, um, you know, move forward. That would ac also accomplish the goal of raising shelter security guard wages while also uplifting the whole sector. Um, and we'd also like to comment on intro 1995, uh, which requires additional training for DHS security guards. And we'd like to recommend that the proposed additional training requirements be provided by an organization and instructors with expertise in social services and or mental health, rather than by a security guard training school and instructors with security guard or law enforcement experience, which is what's currently indicated in the bill. Um, we believe that the additional training needed by security guards working with people experiencing homeless homelessness are in de-escalation, recognizing symptoms of mental health disorders and trauma, communicating with people in crisis. And we think this type of training would be better provided by a social service and mental health experts uh, rather than you know folks in law enforcement. Um, so we'd like to recommend that that change be implemented into intro 1995. Uh, and to conclude, we would like to thank Chair Kalos and Council Member Rosenthal and other members of the Contracts Committee for championing the full funding of the indirect cost rate initiative. We really appreciate that. Um, and we look forward to ensuring, working with you further to ensure that our workforce is-, is Time expired. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. We're gonna hold questions. Our next up, we have SHNNY. JASA and the Coalition for Behavioral Health, at which point we'll open for council member questions. Thank you, Chair. So first up is Tiara Labrada, followed by Nadia Chait, and then uh, Molly Krakowski. Ms. Labrada, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Chair Kalos and all of the members of the City Council Contracts Committee. Uh, it's going to be hard to say anything different than what all of my colleagues have said before me. I think, um, you know, we are we are all um, we're all feeling the same way. So I'll just go ahead and jump into my testimony. My name is Tara Labrada. I'm the Senior Policy Analyst at the Supportive Housing Network of New York. The network is a membership organization representing the nonprofit developers and operators of supportive housing, their staff and tenants therein. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to um, submit comment today regarding intro 2137. Uh, for years, the network and our partners have called on the city council and the administration to recognize the deep wage inequities on city funded contracts in supportive housing and the nonprofit human service sector more broadly. Our women-led workforce has carried the cost of economic inequity for far too long and deserves bold systemic change to address this problem. We are happy that the council and Chair Kalos and so many others are behind us. But given historical precedent, there are some of our members who are hesitant to support this legislation for fear that once again, the city will demand compliance without appropriate compensation. However, we are optimistic that this is a step in the right direction, pr provided that there are clarifications in the bill language and continued partnership between our sector and the city. With that, we do wanna express our support for intro 2137, 2137, but noting the following. We would like to see the term, the human service workforce, quote unquote, defined and expanded to include building workers who may not fall under city contracts. We would like the coalitions and nonprofit community to be active participants in the process as the comptroller sets the wage schedule and like many of my colleagues said before me, making sure that uh, the wage schedule is not based on current wages, so we do not codify those low wages. Uh, again, fully funding the mandate, you know, uh, we want intro 2137 to be fully funded. Um, with historically underfunded contracts, there is really no room in our provider's budget to cover the cost up front. And so the bill should stipulate that the city must have all necessary contract amendments in place before the increased wages are paid out. Also, I think it's important to note that state contracts would not be included in this. And a lot of our providers, uh, some within even the same residences, have uh, staff who are funded under city contracts and some who are funded under state. So we would 
um, like to see the city really advocate at the state level to ensure that these inequities get addressed there too. Uh, with regards to intro 2006, uh, like like Nicole said right before me and Catherine before, we don't want to support a standalone bill that only raises, wa raises, raises wages for one type of worker. Shelter staff, including security and other building workers, should be included under intro 2137. Um, and with that, I, I'm done. I thank you for the opportunity, and we look forward to working with the city to ensure proper compensation for our workforce. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Labrada. Uh, next, we'll hear from Nadia Chait, followed by Molly Krakowski, and then Tawaki Kamatsu. Uh, Ms. Chait, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Kalos and members of the council, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Nadia Chait, the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Coalition for Behavioral Health. Um, we have about 100 community-based mental health and substance use providers as our members. Um, who collectively serve over 600,000 New Yorkers. Um, and this has been a year where their services um, are in demand more than ever before and um, where they're dealing with a society that has experienced such immense trauma. And yet we know that our workforce as you know, I, all of the other coalitions have, have mentioned today that the workforce that is handling these problems is deeply underpaid. And that as we have asked them to not only deal with COVID in their own lives, but to help all of New York through this massive pandemic, um, that we are asking them to do this for some claps instead of a living wage and instead of um, truly thanking them by compensating them appropriately. So we strongly support the efforts to raise the wages for the sector. Um, it, you know, it's a critical issue. Um, and for our sector, um, our low wages contribute to a substantial um, vacancy crisis and turnover crisis. We operate with about 20% vacancy in most programs and about 40% annual turnover. Um, Yesterday, the city announced plans to hire new social workers for schools, which is wonderful. And my members are also now deeply concerned that the city moving to expand mental health services will actually result in a contraction because we know that the city will pay far more for these positions than our members are able to provide. And so they will lose capacity in the community. Um, so we very much appreciate the attention to this issue and the acknowledgement that the low wages are not coming from the nonprofits themselves, but are coming from the city and the rates that the city set in contracts. Um, but I would mirror many of the concerns that other folks have raised um, in terms of just really ensuring sufficient funding for this um, and that this is uh, adequately funded across the board on contracts. Um, we are concerned about how this would apply to um, work at covered employer employees at covered employers, but who don't work on city contracts in our sector. Um, much of the funding comes through Medicaid. As well as some funding um, from commercial insurance and state contracts. Um, and while all of those staff, of course, should receive a higher wage, um, we want to make sure that this is adequately funded um, to allow that or, or not encompassing of those uh, wage streams. And then I, I would certainly agree with all of my colleagues' concerns that we want to make sure that a prevailing wage scale would not codify the current low wages of the sector. And so we would want to ensure that in the development of the wage scale that we would look to the wages that the city pays its own employees, um, as well as in our case, the wages um, of you know, hospitals and managed care companies and other organizations in the private sector uh, to ensure a wage scale that does not codify low wages. Um, but again, we really appreciate the council's attention to this issue and the work um, that you all put in on Indirex. Um, you know, it's wonderful to have council members who really understand the difficulties of our sector and the challenges that we face and are looking to support our workforce. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Chait. And we will next hear from Molly Karkowski, followed by Tawaki Kamatsu. Ms. Krakowski, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Molly Krakowski. I'm Senior Director of Government Affairs at JASA. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Councilmember Kalos and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. 
Um, and we really welcome the opportunity to share some of our concerns regarding intro 2137. Uh, JASA is a nonprofit organization uh, serving older adults across New York City. We have over 40,000 uh, individuals that we serve uh, in programs in Manhattan, Brooklyn, Bronx, and Queens um, with a wide range of services. Uh, the intent of intro 2137, which seeks to establish prevailing wage requirements for city contracted human services workers is very positive. And unfortunately, JASA cannot support the legislation as is currently written. The human service provider community will attest to the remarkable workforce providing critical services to the most vulnerable while simultaneously burdened in their own lives with inadequate wages. For years, JASA and our colleagues in the nonprofit sector have urged the city to increase contract funding to provide appropriate salaries and salary parity across and within city agencies, as well as to institute an annual cost of living adjustment for the contracted workers. For example, throughout the pandemic, these individuals have worked the critical front line in the field, traveling to clients' homes to work and to work sites in order to ensure the safety of our clients. We've continuously asked the administration to recognize our staff as essential workers and compensate them appropriately. In failing to provide funds to compensate essential ser social service workers who are predominantly women of color and immigrants, the city contributes to the very problems of inequality and financial insecurity that we seek to address. JASA recognizes that council member Kalos and the sponsors of intro 2137 have the very best intentions for the human services employees. However, as it is written, intro 2137 leaves the financial burden in the hands of the nonprofit providers. And there is just no way that the human services community can absorb the cost of the prevailing wage. The financial obligation lies exclusively with the administration. While there may be temptations to pass a prevailing wage and work out the details later, an unfunded mandate to pay prevailing wage will devastate our chronically underfunded budgets. Each year, agencies must supplement government contracts with private and philanthropic dollars to make up for the gaps in our program budgets. JASA turns to the New York City Council annually to help and help you do uh, through discretionary funds and council initiatives, adding nearly one and a half million dollars to our budget, and we still have a gap. Uh, and while this week we learned that the administration will follow through on its promise to pay contracted agencies the approved indirect rate, and we're very grateful for that, and those are for services in FY21 and FY22, it's important to recognize that it took two years of advocacy to see the promised funds from FY20 put into the executive budget. Jazz is appreciative of the support of the council for the human services workforce and we will eagerly support future legislation for increased wages in the human services contracts once the language makes it clear that the city is responsible for the funding. And we look forward to your leadership on this issue. And we thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony and look forward to working um, and continuing to work with the city council and the administration as a valued partner. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to conclude this group of people where we we're holding questions. I'm going to ask any council members who have questions to, to raise their hand uh, before we move to the uh, uh, next group of testimony. I just want to echo the sentiments. Uh, I agree that uh, we do have contracts where there are city and state funding sources and that if we did a prevailing wage at the city level, we would need to immediately go to Albany and perhaps even contemporaneously get Albany to agree to make the city, uh, though I will say it becomes a little bit of a chicken and egg scenario. And uh, in conversations with some providers, uh, if we get the prevailing wage here, it may be easier to get it up there. And then in the same guise as the fact that um, we are considering doing prevailing wage for the uh, security workers, I believe that I'm not sure if anyone's questioning whether or not that would be funded or if it would be a fun, unfunded mandate, but in the same way as anything with security workers would have to be funded, same thing goes with any mandate for the prevailing wage. In terms of the concern about being locked into low wages because uh, the statute for the state uh, requires a survey of existing working conditions, uh, I, I hear that sentiment completely and uh, hope that there is a way through bargaining. And if there's other solutions, I'll be reviewing the testimony to try to find that. Uh, so thank you. Uh, seeing if there are any other questions or remarks, 
Seeing none, I want to thank uh, the representatives for so many of our city's uh, nonprofits, and uh, many of you represent coalition groups that represent all of them, perhaps even uh, overlapping. So I want to thank you for all coming out. Uh, please stay in touch because uh, I believe that a lot of this legislation is uh, is moving quickly, and I want to make sure that we make sure your voice is heard and that things are heard as part of the budget conversation. Uh, I, we, I'm now going to call on somebody. We're going to have a two-minute clock. Uh, we have uh, Tawaki uh, Kamatsu, who I've seen at a number of hearings. I'm always happy to welcome him. I wanted to make sure that uh, we brought him up as an individual before we bring up the next panel, which will be considerably uh, longer. Uh, you will have two minutes. Uh, share as you wish. And thank you for joining us and for coming to so many city council hearings. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, time starts now the agenda that for this hearing is to i guess make a determination as to whether to raise the wages for security workers in shelters um yesterday i visited the headquarters of urban pathways i gave them a copy of the motion that i gave to the second circuit yesterday for authorization to file a motion in excess of their page limits meaning um i have a deadline of may 10th uh to submit a motion by I also have an oral argument hearing with the appellate division's first department on May 10th uh, against the HRA. So I've had conversations with Mr. Kalos previously, as well as Ms. Rosenthal. Um, I was assaulted uh, in one of Urban Pathways facilities only because of the fact that HRA and Urban Pathways jointly committed a criminal bait and switch with regards to an apartment lease agreement. That was after an attempted assault. Um, I had a conversation with the Bronx DA last month um, that phone call was recorded on audio. He told me that he subpoenaed one of Urban's, uh, Urban Pathways workers to testify at trial. That worker did not appear. Um, Bronx Criminal Court Judge Corey Weston was aware of that, did not compel the, that person to appear. So I guess with regards to today, today's hearing, the fact we're still in a pandemic, um, why in the heck are you guys considering giving Urban Pathways more funding whatsoever when people are being assaulted in the facilities when that assault has severe repercussions that I would discuss with you previously. Um, I also got discovery material of my federal lawsuit against the city on uh, February 1st. I think you have subpoena power. I read something recently about you subpoenaing records. Do you want to issue a subpoena to the New York City Law Department to get you what I got on February 1st? Because Judge Gabrielle Gornstein won't let me talk about that due to a confidentiality order he issued on um, January 15th of this year. He used to be the general counsel of HRA in the 1990s. So think about it. I've had uh, litigation against HRA since 2016. And then when I get to federal court, I have to go against its former general counsel. Um, so with regard, like I said, with regards Time to- Time expired. Close out. Can you issue that subpoena to get those records and then see what all this has been about? Thank you for testifying. Thank you for your work. And uh, I'm, I'm so sorry for what you went through. Uh, subpoena is an act of last resort. Uh, I can request certain documents. And as with any time we see you or I see you and you share something that is, is as disturbing as you have shared, I, I will follow my mandatory reporting requirements and share with the Department of Investigations, which I also know you have not been thrilled with them either. But uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'd like to, um, we, we now have about uh, 15 to 20 folks uh, who will be testifying. Uh, because of the fact that everything is remote, my understanding is that they are in a space that is remote with telecasting capabilities and video conferencing, uh, but it seems like it might be impractical for us to try to call people individually as folks will be all on one camera. So um, I believe we have about 15 people. We're doing a two minute limit per speaker, uh, but for the sake of convenience, uh, we are just gonna run one 30 minute clock for everyone present on the 32BJ team Zoom. So if that works, if we can get the camera on and the audio on from the 32BJ team Zoom, and does that sound satisfactory to folks at 32BJ team Zoom? We unmute them, please. One moment, Chair. We're going to try and unmute them. Uh, we should note, though, that to the folks at 32PJ, for each uh, person who speaks individually, to please state your name before you begin speaking. 
Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Time starts now. Let's, let's hold the clock while we while we work out the uh, technical difficulty for a moment. Yep, gotcha. And we'll leave them unmuted while they figure that out. Sorry, you're currently muted. We're asking you to unmute. 32 BJ, you need to unmute when we uh, give you the request. There you go. Is it possible for you to unmute the, the other thing? Major echo. Uh, there is a second 32BJ team Zoom, which we've just asked to un unmute. And it seems that we've lost that second. You are currently unmuted on your main dial in, uh, in your main Zoom. Good afternoon. Perfect. We will start the clock. Please hold. Time starts now. My name is Charmaine Lathan. I am a shelter security guard at Travel and Family Shelter. I have been working as a shelter security guard for over a year, and I strongly support intros 1995 to 2006, which will raise up standards for workers like me. I love working in the shelter system. I have been in the client's shoe until November of 2020. I was living in a homeless shelter with myself and my three daughters. I was working full time as a shelter security guard, but I still had no way of affording a place of my own for me and my children. It wasn't until um, I received the public housing voucher that I was able to move out into an apartment in Harlem. The reality of private shelter jobs are clear. We still have to rely on public housing or other government services to simply afford a living and put a roof over our heads. We don't get paid enough and we do not have the necessity the necessary health benefits to sustain ourselves either. I was on Medicaid when I had to have a hysterectomy. We work in stressful environments and perform jobs that are at times very dangerous. But when it comes to having the wages and the benefits to sustain ourselves, we are only a few dollars away from many of the clients we serve. Just because I was fortunate enough to get a housing voucher doesn't mean I am not living a comfortable life. My youngest daughter, who is 16, has dreams of going to college. If we had good paying jobs and higher salaries, I could save up some money to put towards her education. I am barely able to pay all my bills on time. Every paycheck can be the difference between going, sorry, could be the difference between going into the shelter system or holding on to my apartment. Security guards protect the welfare of our sheltered neighbors and staff and allow vital social services to be provided in a safe environment. The city shelter system is the largest in the country. Security guards working as shelters managed by private owned operations under contracts with the city are currently excluded from the privilege, the prevailing wage law and are not covered by the same training requirements. Without these standards, there is nothing to ensure that privately run shelters are providing decent wages, benefits and training opportunities to security workers. I ask the council to pass these bills without delay. The safety in our shelters 
acts will make a real difference in my life and the lives of my three daughters. I know what I feel, what it feels like to be homeless. In order to help these who are living in shelters, I need the training to address critical situations and the safety net of living wages and health insurance. Thank you. Uh, the clock is running. If the next person can please join us. Please start. Yes, hi. Um, my name is Monique Smith. I am a shelter security guard at Manhattan Times Square Family Shelter. I've been working as a, as a shelter security guard for three years. I strongly support intros 1995 and 2006, which will raise up standards for workers like me. When I was pregnant, I moved out of my parents' house. I was in a shelter system until I received my first apartment. Currently, I live with my 10-year-old daughter in a one-bedroom apartment in public housing. I make $16.50 an hour. And this isn't enough to sustain a life in New York City. I rely on Medicaid for healthcare. Through 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic has devastated the city I call home, and it has also pushed our city to a breaking point. We have been working on the front line through this entire pandemic. It's time we were paid, paid that we were paid a fair wage. Because of my experience, I understand how important it is for New York City work to improve the standards of, of the city shelter system and expand access to permanent affordable housing. But how can you address homelessness and poverty while creating jobs that don't allow people to get by in this city without public assistance? Security guards are vital to keeping shelters safe and are necessary for shelters to operate. The city's Shelter system is the largest in the country. We can and it should do better. When we make these jobs good jobs, we make shelters safer. We help lift people of poverty and depending on social services. All guards at work at working at a at any shelter contracted by the city should have, have should have access to affordable health care and access to real training. Guards in all city contracted shelter should be provided with decent wages. I ask the council to pass this bill without delay. The Safety and Our Shelters Act will have, will make a, di a real difference in my life. I would pay my bills, be able to take care of my kid. Right now with the money we have, I can't afford anything. I would be able to, I would be able to afford more school supplies for my child. It would also mean having access to better training so that shelters would be safer. Hello everyone. Thank you for your attendance and your time. My name is Amber Drummond. I work and I live in a shelter. I live in Queens at a, a shelter uh, by JFK. I work at Brookville Holiday Inn. Mm -hmm. So after um, long days of work, I I go home. Well, I go to the shelter and I try and relax. I look for housing. And I've been working in the industry for over two years and I strongly support I strongly support 1995 slash 2006 um, to raise uh, awareness to raise standards for workers like myself. In addition to that, it's for uh, better training. I actually make $16.50 an hour and it's not enough to lift myself out of the shelter system. And decent wages would mean that I could actually save up enough to move out somewhere else without any subsidies. As a shelter officer, we work in dangerous environments, highly stressful environments with little pay. 
shelter security officers protect the welfare of our shelter neighbors and, and staff and allow vital services to be provided in, safe envir in a safe environment. Within the last year, I suffered multiple in injuries, injuries at work, including an open wound near my eye and a rotator cuff breaking up a fight between staff and residents. In order to de-escalate dangerous inter interactions, clients between clients and to protect ourselves better, we need access to real and continuous training. In addition, we need affordable health care that these bills will provide us. I cannot remember the last time I went to see a doctor, even through the, the pandemic. I rely on teas and herbal remedies to keep myself well and able to fight another day. If we cannot keep ourselves healthy and aware of our environment, we'll all fail. So today I'm asking you to support us. In addition, we need affordable health care and the, the raising of wages. Security officers at the shelters managed by private managed by private operators under contract with the city are currently excluded from prevailing wages and are not covered by the same training requirements. Without these standards, there is nothing to ensure that privately run shelters are providing decent wages, benefits, or training opportunities. And without these standards, I don't see a way for our shelters to be safe or for me to get out of the shelter. As private security officers, we cannot afford to live in New York City. Many of us work overtime and we still remain homeless or at risk of losing our homes. We are not working, we are the working poor of the city because our jobs don't provide our families sustainable wages, healthcare, or training that we need. I asked the council to pass bills without delay. With the safety in our shelters act, I can finally afford a place to call home, which is just a tiny home, by the way. Thank you for your time, guys. Ah. Hello. Good to meet you. My name is my, my name is Anthony Kenner, and I'm a shelter security guard at Cliff Hotel. It's a family shelter. I strongly support intros 1995 and 2006 because raising up standards for workers like me is long overdue. I have been working as a shelter security guard now for 13 years. I went to work through the pandemic, through the pandemic on the front lines, commuting for an hour and a half each way on public transit to do my job to help keep shelter clients safe. I asked the council to take action to pass these bills. We need this. We need this. The safety of our shelter acts will make a real difference in my life currently. I'm behind on my rent. If I pay my rent, then I can't buy groceries. Sometimes I have to make, sometimes I have to make the sacrifice. When I was sacrificing on groceries, I'm undernourished, but I don't pay my rent. 
I'll be further in debt. I'll have no health coverage. I have no health coverage and I can't afford regular visits to maintain my health and take care of my medical conditions. We deserve to be basically respect. We deserve the basic respect of the job that doesn't keep us in poverty. We need basic respect of a job that, that really won't keep us in poverty and give access to affordable health care and real training. Sometimes I feel like they speak to us like we're slaves. We deserve to be included under the, the prevailing wage law. As New York City works to make sure that everyone have access to a safe shelter, the security guards who work to secure these shelters should not be left out of the picture. Our work should have the safe, the same training requirements as guards working at the city. Uh, guards working at the city run shelters do. We work with people suffering from PTSD and other mental health issues. Please help us receive the training we need to better de-escalate situations and provide a safe environment for our clients. My name is uh, Francisco Batista. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of these two important bills for shelter security guards. I work at the shelter security for 10 years. I currently work for Acacia at a MICA women's shelter in Long Island City. I also live in Queens with my wife and nine year old daughter. MICA shelters serve the mentally ill and chemically addicted. Working with this client population can be demanding on security staff. We often deal with the difficult and high risk situations like intervening to settle clients with arguments and occur in protecting clients when fights break. Fortunately, I haven't been injured, but in some times it feels unsafe and we don't get enough training from the employer on how to deal with these incidents. I'm a professional in the security industry, and I know that other jobs aren't like this. I currently work a second security job in a commercial office building in Manhattan. There we get all the training we need for what we really like to encounter on site. We understand the protocols and use logbooks to keep track of incidents and issues from when we do our inspections. This doesn't happen at the shelter. Prior to working at this shelter site, I worked at an apartment building used as a temporary homeless shelter. The contractor there paid the industry standard wages and benefits. In my opinion, the security standards were much better. I took a pay cut when that site was closed down and I started working while I'm now from over $18 with benefits to $16.50 with, benefits, with no benefits. I'm just lucky that I have health insurance from my other job at the office building where we have the union. My shelter is always on the, on the staff. It's no wonder they find it hard to recruit and retain guards when they don't treat us like professionals. I've completed the qualifications to be fire life safety director. There needs to be someone with this credential on the site 24 hours a day, but I don't get paid any extra for it. In the, in the security industry, the FLSD position is well respected and considered a good career progression. But when shelter operation, operators are trying to make 
savings on the backs of workers, this respect is forgotten. We need a city to ensure that the shelter security contractors at privately managed sites pay the same prevailing wages and benefits that guards and FLSD earn the city managed sites. We are the professionals working in to protect vulnerable New Yorkers. There shouldn't be any difference in our pay, but ability to support our families. I urge your support safely in our shelter acts. Thank you. Hello, my name is Shaquille Shepard, and I'm a shelter security guard at Quality Inn, Long Island City. I have been working as a shelter security guard for almost three years. I strongly support intro of 1995 and 2006, which will raise up standards for workers like me. I myself am formerly homeless and live with my mother in a shelter. The pandemic has devastated our communities, but we kept working as essential workers on the front line. We deserve to be paid a fair wage. Often clients will refuse to wear masks. And when I reported the issue, no action was taken. Even though this, both, this puts both clients and workers at greater risk and makes me feel unsafe. As I make my way home on the bus, it takes two hours to get home at night. And I have to wonder if I am bringing COVID back home to my mother. She is unable to work, she is disabled, she has a long list of heart problems and high blood pressure. We got lucky and very fortunate that we have a Section 8 apartment. We split the rent and sometimes I try to make her comfortable, help her with food and give her a little extra so she has some money left in her pocket. With a little bit more in wages, I could have more financial security and I could also pay off my student loans. We also need to we also need access to affordable healthcare and access to real training. Right now, we are not excluded from the same training requirements as guards working at other shelters. We need this, not just for guards and our families, but also to make sure we raise standards for shelter security and safety. Proper protocols will be followed to report problems when they happen. Better training would help us prevent fights from happening so that guards would act faster. With Without these standards, there's nothing to ensure that privately run shelters are providing decent wages, benefits, and training opportunities to security workers. I have no health insurance and other than, under the new legislation, I would, I would be able to get coverage. The safety in our shelter acts is needed. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Benice Carter. I worked as a guard for over three years. I work in the Bronx. We provide services for men and women, some disabled, some struggling with drug addiction. I'm asking you today to support the Safety in Our Shelter Act. Improving the shelter system and jobs, security guards is personal for me. I also been homeless myself only two years ago. It was the hardest year of my life. I done everything as far as continuing working, praying, praying. I also volunteered and took training to improve such as getting my mental health certificate, just to work better with clients that has mental health issues. <laughs> it's important to me that the company reimburse me for some of my skills that I learned to help the shelter. Through my training and experience, I was able to build relationships with clients in diffuse situations. This helps the, the shelter run smoothly and get me home safely at the end of my shift. Okay. <laughs> Earning the prevailing wage will make a massive difference in my life. It will mean a pay increase that will help me pay my bills that could find me while I was off work. I recently had been positive for COVID in February. My company made me use my sick time, but I ended up losing income and falling behind on my rent. 
It was only because of the COVID stimulus check that I was able to make it up. Shelter guards like me are dedicated to improving on jobs and building good lives for our family and ourselves. I urge you to give us this bill, your support so that we have the training, paid benefits. Good afternoon. My name is Tracy Holmes, and I am a shelter security guard at the Comfort and Sunset Men's Shelter. I have been working as a shelter security guard for almost a year. I strongly support intros 1995 and 2006, which, which will raise up standards for workers like me. Through 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic has devastated the city I call home with so many New Yorkers losing their lives and many others losing their jobs. It has also pushed our city to a break, breaking point. We have been working on the front line through this entire pandemic, raising our lives, risking our lives and risking spreading COVID to our families. For much of the pandemic, we came to work day in, day out without even being given proper PPE. It is time we were paid a fair wage. It's um, access for better training is important to me so that I can handle different situations that may arise in our day-to-day -day duties. The escalating training would be very helpful because it teaches you how to respond to issues. The more training makes you a better and more confident at your job. The clients really just want to know that you're listening and we want to be able to help them feel safe and get the help they need. I ask the council to pass these bills without delay. The safety of our shelters acts will make a real difference in my life. I don't have health insurance and I have to pay for my medication out of pocket because I have to ration the medication I take for my high blood pressure because I am unable to afford it. I have not been back to the doctor in a while because it's so expensive. I really need to be seen. This bill would help me and my family and lift up our communities. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson Kalos and committee members. My name is Nefertiti Edwards. I've worked in a shelter security for four years and currently working at Acacia's Network Shelter in Long Island City. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the committee in, supporting, in support of the Safety in Our Shelter Act, Shelter Acts. Passing these bills into laws will be life-changing for me. I support my mother, which stretches me financially. I'm currently backed up on my rent, but I know looking after is the right thing to do. I also have a number of health conditions, asthma, bronchitis, diabetes, high blood pressure, and migraine headaches. I've also been referred to a cardiologist. Getting paid the prevailing wage and having access to quality health insurance will make an enormous difference. I've overcome struggles before. I've been homeless myself due to lack, due to domestic violence. Surviving in the city on low wages is another struggle. I'm asking committee members and council to do your part and make this struggle a little bit easier. Please give these bills your support. And when they come up for a vote, do everything in your power to pass them into law. Thank you for listening. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Juan Reyes. I'm a security officer at the Acacia Shelter in the South Bronx. I'm here today to testify in support of the safety in our shelter acts. I've worked at the shelter security for over 10 years. It's clear to me that we cannot improve the security standards in our shelters if we don't, don't improve the training and employment standards of security guards. 
Shelters are a challenging place to work. Clients accessing shelter are often unstable and experiencing mental health conditions. There is an unfortunately the risk of confrontation and violence. I have personally been pushed and threatened. I also seen colleagues pushed and shelter sites vandalized. I often feel unsafe on the job. We are understaffed and lack equipment like metal scanners. Guards should have more specialized training, particularly how to defuse and deescalate situations. Having better trained guards who feel safer on the job could help reduce turnover and solve the chronic guard shortage we experience. Better wages and benefits would also help to, re to recruit and retain guards. It's not right that we work in the same high-risk environment as guards at city-managed sites, but aren't guaranteed the same wages and benefits. Receiving the prevailing wage would make a huge difference to my family's life. We've been through a lot of instabilities. My wife has recently, recently in a homeless shelter herself. We are renting an apartment now in the South Bronx Bosch or living paycheck to paycheck. I work two jobs. I would love to be able to buy things for my three kids and move to a better apartment. I currently, I have um, health insurance, Metro Plus, that I pay out of pocket. Under the prevailing wage standards, my employer would have to pay my benefits, supplements that could cover quality full, full family health care insurance. This could, this could be life changing for my family. My wife recently had COVID. We need the confidence that our medical costs are covered and we can get the care and medicine. Time expired. Thank you. Thank you. How many more speakers do we have so we know how much time to add to the clock? Ten minutes. Okay, we will add ten minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Carlos and committee members. My name is Rafael Cruz, and I'm here today to ask you to support the Safety in Our Shelters Act. I've been a security guard in the shelter system for 12 years, and I currently work for Security USA in the Harlem YMCA shelter system. We need improved security guards and standards in our shelters. By ensuring that guards earn the industry standard wages and benefits and receive more specialized training, this bill will make a big difference. Shelter systems are a dangerous place to work. We are the first line of defense, but we're, we're under training. On a daily basis, we encounter risk clients and weapons, hazards, and different things that we have to go through that normally other shelters do. Training is the key in order to encounter, training is, excuse me, training is the key in order for guards to know what to do. I see new workers put on the job without being given the proper training. When this happens, everyone is less safe and new guards themselves and other guards like me. I'm a fire safety director, coordinator at the shelter. This is an important job, but I'm, I'm paid less than workers who get the prevailing wages. I also do not get paid vacations or time off and our work standards are different. While doing, while doing the same role at the shelter, man in the city. I am married and I have a 13 year old daughter. Getting paid the, the getting paid the prevailing wage and benefit supplements would make a huge difference to us. I currently have my wife's health insurance plan through her job. Having meaningful benefits provided by the employer would not only mean my family has a more has more options when it comes to our insurance coverage, but it also means contribution towards our retirement plan. I urge you to pass these bills. Our work is crucial to keeping the shelter system safe. We need to give our jobs and our and our lives the value they deserve. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson and committee member. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to testify today. My name is Mama V. Matiaposan. Uh, I work as guard in the shelter system over two years, and I work for Alive Universal Security Services at the shelter in the Bronx managed by Community Life. Guard working in shelter managed by private providers need better way 
benefits and training. That is what exactly the bill are considering, you are considering today will give us. Shelter can be high risk location for God to work. Most dangerous situation I have encountered was when a client attempted to hit me with a fire and sanction. All girls need adequate training to deal with volatile situation so they can be disescalated. Therefore, shelter can be made safe for all residents and staff. We also need to be paid fairly for the work we do and the risk we deal with. The concept of equal pay for equal work is a cornerstone work pay principle firmly rooted in America core value of equity and fairness. Vers of American support equal pay regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic level. And is frequently identified as a top priority, especially for those who face sharp pay disparities. Securing equal pay requires more than word and lofty platitude. It requires bold action at all levels. Voluntary action by private employees should be commanded, but they are not the certainty of a strong legal protection backed by government enforcement to hold institutions accountable. To make the promise of equal pay for equal work real, it must be more than voluntary option. That is why we need this bill. We need the power of law to ensure that security guard working in the shelter system for private provider or pay fairly for their work and can vindicate their right. I have family in Togo, including two children in university. If I, if I earn the prevailing wages, of 1845, it will mean I will be able to save money to send to them. Passing this law would also mean I will have access to affordable quality health insurance. Right now, I have no insurance. I can afford the CC per week it costs to take up the employee's plan. Please support this law and reform that can help strength equal pay protection for workers. Hello, my name is Quintana Onwed and I'm a shelter security guard at Crystal Place. I have been working as a shelter security guard for almost eight years. I, sh I strongly support intros 1995 and 2006, which will raise up standards for workers like me. Through 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic has devastated the city I call home. So many people have lost their lives. We have been working on the front lines of this entire pandemic and our communities are in crisis. It is time we are paid a fair wage. Safe shelters are essential in New York City. Security guards play a vital role in providing a safe haven to people in need. Quality jobs for shelter security guards must be part of the picture. 
I know how important this is because I was a client in the shelter system myself. In 2012, when I gave birth to my son, we lost our apartment because our landlord was selling the building and wanted them to get rid of all the tenants. I had to live in a shelter for six months. My mother was eligible for Section 8 as a military veteran, so we eventually were able to move in with her. I have a second job as a medical assistant. I work more than full-time hours on the day shift at the clinic and overnight at the shelter. I need a job so that I can make enough money to not have to work overnight so that I can stay home with my eight-year-old son. My mother is planning on moving and won't be able to watch him at night. Sometimes I get calls from his school. I have to leave work because my mother who has her own medical issues cannot watch him. He has ADHD and I wish I was able to be there for him more instead of having to work two jobs. We also need to, we also need to affordable health care and access to real training. Security guards working at shelters managed by private operators under contract with the city are currently excluding from the prevailing wage law and are not covered by the same training requirements as guards working at city-run shelters. Without these standards, there is nothing to ensure that privately run shelters are providing decent wages, benefits, and training opportunities to security workers. I ask the council to pass these bills without delay. The Safety in Our Shelters Act will make a real difference in my life. Currently, I have no health insurance from my place of employment. I rely on Medicaid. I would also, I would also mean having access to better training to handle difficult situations that we constantly arise in our day-to-day -day duties. Thank you. Hello? Uh, hold on one moment. We'll add four minutes to the clock, please. You may begin. Okay. My name is Terry Batson. I am 59 years old. I've been working with the shelter and system for two years. I strongly support the safety in our shelter, 1995 and 206. But I feel uh, we need more like better training and better medical insurance, better working condition and better pain raises, especially with my health and um, issue. Because I suffer with diabetes, arthritis, glaucoma, cataract in both eyes. And I use them on my own um, medical insurance. And sometimes it's very hard to go see, I'm a doctor right now. And sometimes it's very hard for me to pay for my medication. So that's why I want to, uh, for the pass, uh, that's why I want the law for them to pass the bill. You know, for me to get um, better um, um, support and all of that. That's all I got to say. My name is Kofi Sotom. I am a shelter security guard at the Best Western JFK Women Shelter. I have been working as a shelter security guard for almost three years. I strongly support INSRO 1995 and 2006, which will raise up the standard for workers like me. Currently, I have no health insurance from my place of employment. I rely on Metroplus, subsidized sub healthcare I qualify for. I came here for the America dream. My wife and my young children are in Ghana and they rely on me to pay for their rent and the schooling. 
I share an apartment currently with a roommate. And I want to be able to afford to have a decent home for them so that they can be here with me. I work two jobs and still it is not enough. I came here from Ghana in 2004. I asked the council to pass these bills without a delay. It is not right that because we security work at a shelter managed by private operators, we should be executed from the prevailing wage law. We are paid less and not covered by the same training requirement as God working at city run shelter. Even though these shelters are also contracted by the city, we need this standard for our soul and our family. And uh, so we can assess Time better expired. The work we do is difficult, almost daily. I encounter a client that threatened to assault me or another client. We need help to keep people and ourselves safe. We need training. We protect and the safety of the client and our community by helping secure shelters. We work through one of the most difficult times our city has faced on the front line of the pandemic. Our work is vital too for the city mission to make sure all New Yorkers can access safe shelter in a time of need. We need to be fairly compensated for our work. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that is all the speakers that we have. If everyone who read testimony is able to please uh, submit it. Uh, the address for submissions, committee council. It's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, the record will remain open for 72 hours after this hearing. So please consider submitting testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, I want to thank everyone who shared testimony, particularly the workers who shared a lot of the conditions that you're dealing with. To the extent that you yourself are seeing any conditions that are a concern or are subject to retaliation following this hearing, please feel free to reach out to me directly at contracts at benkalos.com. We will work with you. We will work with the Department of Investigations to ensure that you have safe working conditions. I want to thank everyone who uh, testified today. I want to thank our nonprofit providers and uh, 32BJ and our workers uh, at our homeless shelters. And at this point, I'd like to ask if there's anyone else here who wishes to testify today. Uh, seeing none, I'd like to thank everybody, thank the committee staff and my staff. Uh, and I hereby conclude this meeting of the City Council Committee on Contracts.